okay well um i think we can uh, we can start now i think everyone else can just sort of trickle in um i am delighted to welcome um edward hanazo to the theory of living systems webinar um edward is uh, well edward's got fairly recently started his own group in ist austria uh, um and uh, but he's done some fantastic work on uh, morphogenesis um in the context of branching morphogenesis in uh in lungs and mammary glands and also but also things to do with epithelial sheets and deformations in uh in the context of sort of early embryogenesis um and, I, and that i'm probably missing some huge part of, of edward's literature i don't want to sort of pretend to know it exhaustively um but um but yeah so i, I think um you should all go and check out edward's work I uh, I think uh, I think some of it's absolutely fantastic, um, and um, and with that uh, maybe you can just take it away, Edward. Yeah. So so thank you so much for the invitation and, and, and the kind introduction. Um, so, um, so so indeed I, I have been I have had for three years and a half now a, a group of uh, theoretical uh, biophysics in uh, in East Austria, and today I'd like to talk about uh, two projects that were really done in collaboration with uh, with uh, groups of cell and neuronal biology. And uh, this really has to do with sort of understanding the principles of mechanochemical couplings and how mechanical and biochemical signals uh, couple to give rise to instabilities um, that can be useful to understand uh, processes such as uh, collective cell migration, which will be the first part of the talk, and organ morphogenesis, which will be the, the second part of the talk. So, um, um, so, so as I said, the, the main one of the big questions that interests the lab is this quite is is the topic of of self organization and how you make patterns um, um, out of nothing uh, during um, in 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 biological systems and in particular in development. And of course, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, one of the paradigm for this uh, has been uh, for, for the past uh, so sixty years, uh, uh, seventy years, has been uh, Turing's. Uh, theory of uh, morph um, of uh, reaction diffusion uh, which it, where morphogenesis proceeds through the interaction of two uh, biochemical species that diffuse at different rates and um, and uh, react to, to, with, with, with one another how, how, uh, however it's, it's been known also since the 80s at least uh, for instance in, from uh, from the work of Mary and Oster um, that you can have a number of instabilities that proceed from um, and, and patterns that proceeds from the mechanical from the from the mechanical properties uh, of tissues, such as this this example, for instance, um, from the Mahadevan and Taban group, where where, uh, where buckling of the of the intestine uh, simply proceeds through an elastic instability between um, which comes from the different crucial growth of two tissues, and of course uh, th these are two extremes. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's very likely that uh, real systems are going to involve some mix uh, of the two components. Uh, but the question that we want to understand is really what are the minimal, uh, can you understand the couplings between these two in a minimal way? And do they give rise to novel uh, type of instabilities that might be interesting um, from a theoretical side, but also in terms of uh, applications and in, in terms of sort of providing um, information and robustness to, uh, to developmental systems. So, so one of the examples, for instance, which I will talk about are patterns which arise through uh, collective cell migration. Um, collective cell migration has been looked at quite a bit for, uh, for, for a number in a, a number of in vivo uh, situations, but also in elegant uh, in vitro studies in the past uh, um, in the past ten or twenty years. One typical um, one typical um, assay that people have done is to uh, plate uh, cells in a two D geometry um, and by using sensors to to, to have a well defined initial condition. Uh, where, for instance, you make cells in this rectangular shape, and then you remove the sensor, and then you, you, you have cells migrating outwards, like if they would be closing a wound, but without really any sort of chemical damage signals, nor, um, nor uh, and, and in a really, really well-confined geometry. And surprisingly, this relatively minimal assay gives rise to a number of really interesting uh, emergent phenomena. So if you if you look at the, uh, if you look at these chemographs of this monolayer expanding, for instance, in this, in, in this direction, uh, what the group of Xavier Trepa, for instance, ten years ago showed is that this is not sort of a simple uh, dilation, but instead, if you look at um, if you look at the chemographs of velocities of stream, you see these these waves, this wave propagation. Um, where waves, where waves propagate inside the tissue during the expand during during these expansions, and also if you look even at confluent monolayers here, uh, so there's no free edge; everything is sort of um, 
um, isotropic, you can still see that there's a number of interesting patterns uh, that arise uh, at length scales much larger than, uh, than, than the one of the individual cells, right? So this is, so, so, and these are all cells of the same type, and this is really a minimal system in which you can look, in, in which you, uh, also from the theoretical side, where you can look at uh, the emergence of complex, um, of complex patterns uh, through, through simple, uh, through, through the interactions of a few um, of of, uh, of cells of the same types, and this is something I should say that, that, that many people have been interested in. Many people have been interested in, and uh, there's been a number of really nice work in, in the past uh, in the past ten years to try to understand this um, this this type of patterns. However, one of the things um, to note here is that um, this is all face conscious microscopy, right? So, so, so this is telling you something about the mechanical state of the system, the shape of the sense, but there's really limited, limited data on, on the internal or the chemical state of these cells, right? Uh, they appear, I mean, on face conscious, of course, they appear uh, as the same, but, but, uh, but, but is that really the case, right? And um, an experiment which uh, has been uh, which which has illuminated, I think, to me at least, uh, this type of uh, this type of assays is one uh, which has been looked, for instance, by the OEK group um, and, and also by by, by their collaborators, which I'll mention just later, is to look the same to do the same kind of assays, but with um, FRET sensors which measure the activity in live of specific proteins. And here, this is again a wound healing assay where um, the, the cells are going to migrate in this direction and each dot here is a nucleus. And uh, the color is the activity of the MAP uh, kinase ERK pathway. And why this one? Well, it's, it, there's, there's many reasons for this, but it's a really interesting pathways because it's known to be mechanosensitive and also involved in force, in force sensing among many other things. So, so it's really quite an interesting uh, pro, um, uh, active pro protein if you want to get interested in the interplay between mechanics and chemistry in these kind of systems. And if you run the movie uh, here, uh, the really nice thing that you see, I, I hope that you can see um, it, online, is you see that spontaneously you self-organize into these complex waves, right, rays of red uh, that that go that, that start from the edge of the wound and go inside the tissue, right. So there's clearly some some sort of also some biochemical patterns um, that are going on uh, that are going on in the system. Uh, and again, you, you might think that this is this is a rather specific system, right? This is in vitro in two D. Uh, does this have anything to do with with with, with reality? Well, there's more and more in vivo situation where this happens. If you actually make a, an, a wound in a real mouse, this is in vital imaging of the epidermis of a real mouse, you also see uh, waves of ERK that emanate from, uh, from the wound. And it's been shown, for instance, that in other regeneration context or developmental context recently, uh, you see these waves of ERK, uh, di uh, directional waves of ERK with a finite wavelength that span through the tissue. Um, so, so this really might be something a bit general, and intuitively you might think, well, these things are going from the uh, from, from the uh, these are directional. They're going from the edge of the tissue to the bulk. You could imagine that this sort of conveys information, um, and and for instance, telling cells uh, where to go, where, where they should go, in order, for instance, in this setting, uh, to close a wound. Right? This this uh, makes sense intuitively, but we really wanted to test this and to try to understand the both the biophysical origin and the design principles. Of this kind of instabilities um, in, in systems. Um, the, the last piece of data, the, the last piece of data I would like to show you is that uh, again, if you if you this is not this is not something specific to uh, having a wound. Um, I showed you this movie before, right, where things are in bulk and you still have these interesting sort of spatial temporal waves of of density and, and velocity. But if you make again these ERC movies. Um, in, in a 2D setting, you see this again, this really beautiful um, uh, 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 patterns of, of now isotropic waves which propagate in every direction um, in ERC. So this is really something that's not, not specific to, um, to, um, to, to free edges, but that really happens continuously um, in, in the system. And so before going further, I should really say that uh, this, all, all of the theory I'm going to present here is the work of a great PhD student in the lab, Daniel Bokok, and all of the experiments um, uh, are, are, have been done by, by a really talented PhD student now, Yaino, um, in, in Kyoto, now actually in, uh, doing his postdoc in IST in the Eisenberg lab. And also, uh, it was a really fun collaboration with the lab of Tsuyoshi uh, Hiroshima, who did, everything I'm, uh, who did everything on the experimental side I'm going to show in the next few slides. So um, the first question we had is, OK, so you, you, you get this information. Now you can see that there is density and, 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 and velocity waves, which are indicative of some mechanical uh, components. But you also see 
um, this 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 um, biochemical patterns of work. And of course, one could be um, just passively downstream of the other, or they could be organized in a proper sort of uh, in, in a proper mechanochemical feedback loop. And that's really what we wanted to dissect here. So the first thing that we did is to try to analyze a bit further uh, this kind of instability. Um, to try to measure at the same time both the, the chemical sensitivity of the cell, so ERK, so ERK and by, by volume oscillation, for instance, mechanical information such as the area of cells. And we try to and we try to cross correlate the two. And you can see that the two, uh, if you do a cross correlation of area and um, and ERK, you can see that the two are indeed uh, robustly correlated. Uh, correlated so high uh, high ERK also means high area. And if you look more in detail, you can see that this peaks slightly negatively, uh, which means that um, area comes first and a few minutes uh, area changes first. And then this is positively correlated a few minutes later with ERK activity. And so this really hinted at a simple, given that ERK is known to control uh, stresses and forces in the cells, uh, this gives rise to an intuitive picture where maybe there is sort of a feedback from ERK to tension to cell shape um, and, and that closes the loop. But this is all qualitative, and we wanted now on the theoretical side to ask essentially what's the type of mechanochemical models you can write um, that that, um, that 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 um, that have the right phenomenology. Let's say the first thing we're going to do, and that's and that's a constant actually in the two projects, is uh, we're going to start actually with uh, with with writing down the mechanical uh, a mechanical equations for these for these monolayers because. Um, this is actually something we can do in quite a, a principled way. And so we will try to, 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 to let's say, do, do it first from first principles as far as we go. And then we will add sort of couplings, uh, which can be more arbitrary, but then constrain that uh, with experimental data. So if you, if you, if you look at, at these uh, monolayers from the side, essentially, um, what, one thing you can write for the, mechanical, for, for, for the mechanics of those is those cells are um, essentially, um, um, don't, don't adjust their volume that much. If there's, if there's density changes, it's 2D density, and at constant volume, that means that the aspect ratio of the cells is going to change. And what controls the aspect, what we can write to understand the aspect ratio of the cell is we can write essentially its force balance, where there's both sort of this natural tension, this vertical tension here. Um, uh, so, so this is under tension, and this, yellow, uh, and this sort of red thing is also under tension. And you can write the energy of the cell, which is essentially writing it as a foam. Um, where the configuration of the cell is to minimize its uh, its energy. So you write the energy as the sum of uh, tensions multiplied by 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 areas, as as essentially in the physics of forms or, or so bubbles. And then you can minimize those, and you can so, so, so this is writing for instance that both tensions T and gamma uh, can in principle depend on ERK, and then that the energy is the product of this tension with uh, with this lateral area in green, uh, or respectively this lateral area in red. And uh, because of the constant volume constraint, you can actually relate the height of the cells uh, with, its, which, with, with its thickness, uh, and you can write the force. Uh, you, you can write the force um, that's uh, that's associated with the deformation of one of these cells. And uh, actually, you can linearize. Uh, you, uh, if you linearize all of this, you end up with a very simple picture, actually. Um, where essentially this 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 monolayer boils down actually to a chain of over, to an overdamped uh, chains of springs. So overdamped because it's in frictional contact with the with the with with the substrate, and um, and it wants to go to a rest length L zero, which is a which is the ratio of these two tensions. But now because this rest length here, uh, this sum of these two tensions. Uh, depends uh, on ERK. In principle, they can they, they have no reason to depend on ERK uh, exactly in the same way. And therefore, um, I need to write uh, I need to write now a constitutive equation for my rest length and how my rest length changes with uh, my biochem uh, the, the biochemical state of the cell. And of course, uh, this can be uh, quite arbitrary, right? Because um, this ERK can change. Uh, any tension in principle in, a, in, an, in, a, in an arbitrary way. So, so this is just sketching the mechanical side of, uh, of the problem. And now you need to you need to couple you, you need to couple um, this 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 rest uh, the, the, the main the, the, the main parameter you need to couple to the biochemistry is this rest length and the preferred length of the of the cells. Um, so the cool thing for this is that uh, Tsurushi uh, had sort of uh, a number of cool tools to constrain this. One thing in particular they could do is optogenetically activate ERK in, in these monolayers. And if you optogenetically activate ERK, what you see is that at, at, at hour zero, you can see that the monolayer shrinks. And that's a really cool essay because that, that really is a way to test the coupling from biochemistry to mechanics, right? You activate ERK here and the monolayer shrinks. 
So, that's, so that means that activating ERC decreases celeria. That gives you the size of the coupling from ERC to, to, uh, to your preferred length. But the other th cool experiment they could do is they could also take these, mono these, these, these monolayers and stretch them or compress them, essentially, by, changing, by, by controlling the mechanics and seeing, the, in, in, uh, and seeing how the ERC um, how ERC activity changes with mechanical perturbation. And what they found is that decreasing mechanically celeria by compression inhibits ERC. And you can do, and, and, this is, and, and if you do the reverse of increasing celeria, you, you, do, you do exactly the, uh, the, the thing the other side. So that's a really cool experiment that constrain really the sign of the, that, that first of all prove that there are uh, couplings between mechanics and chemistry, and that also gives you the sign of the couplings. And already without going too much into the model, uh, you can see straight away from this, uh, why the system is going to tend to oscillate, right? Because uh, activating ERC decreases celeria, but decreasing celeria inhibits ERC. That's a really classical um, activator inhibitor system uh, that, 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 that is known to give rise generically uh, to temporal oscillations, right? So it shouldn't be completely surprising from these components, uh, uh, theoretically, that you're going to end up uh, giving uh, rise to an uh, oscillatory component in the system. Um, to, to do this a bit more systematically, you can actually write the simplest uh, linear model, um, um, the, the simplest linear model for this, and essentially to the to the simplest, uh, the model boils down to three uh, to, to, to to three equations. The first one is an equation of on position, and that's essentially uh, force balance. So this on on uh, and that's on the cell position R, and that tells you that that's just an overdamped uh, chains of springs um, where the rest length can change, where the rest length of zero uh, can, can change. Then you have an equation. Uh, which relates the, the rest length to, to ERC, and, and, we, and we, we know that this sign is negative, so we can write a generic coupling alpha. And then you have the negative, and, and then you need to close this by, by writing an equation from ERC activity to, uh, to, uh, to mechanics and celeria, which is uh, the, the derivative of, uh, of your deformation field. That's, and that's a simple equation, uh, that's a simple set of equations with relatively few um, um, uh, parameters. Um, which, 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 can, which, can describe, which can describe the system. And the cool thing is that all parameters are extractable from, uh, from the experiments I'm going to show later. So if you, if you analyze the system a little bit, uh, what you see is that uh, this, has a, this has an instability. And interestingly, this instability only depends on the product of these two couplings. So alpha is the coupling from chemistry to mechanics, beta is the coupling from, from mechanics to chemistry. And if you, if you, if you crank this, the, the product of these two couplings, Above a certain a certain threshold, which only depends on the three time scales of the problem, um, essentially you give rise to to an instability uh, that specifies both a finite wavelength and a finite period, which is cool because it's exactly what we wanted, right? We want we we, we had an instability which both had a period, a temporal period, and a wavelength. And interestingly, um, because the model is non dimensionalized based on uh, the length and non dimensionalized based on cell size. You end up having predictions for the wavelength and the period, which only depends on the time scales of the system. And you can really see that you couldn't go, you, you couldn't make the system any smaller because if you put any of the time scale to zero or to infinity, for instance, uh, you lose you 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 lose all of the you, you lose all of the interesting properties of, of the system. Um, so the first thing, and, and, and uh, before constraining it, the, the basic idea between this actually uh, is quite simple. The period comes from these two, uh, these, two these two time scales, and this is really because it comes from activator inhibitor dynamics, right? So you have this activator dynamics between the between the, your preferred length and the ERC, and that specifies a time scale. But then, because your cells are in frictional contact, not everyone it's a zero sum game, right? Not everyone can be small. Can be small. If you want to be small, then your neighbors have to be bigger. And since you have friction. Uh, that specifies a length scale, a length scale which is basically um, the the length on which uh, cells can contract given to friction in one length in one time scale of your of your activator inhibitor dynamics. So that's that, that qualitatively um, sort of theoretically makes sense. Now can we constrain uh, that model? It turns out yes. The, the cool thing, for instance, that we could see is that if you take this optogenetic experiment, uh, this is essentially putting a, a let's say a heavy side function. Of, um, of, of biochemical activity. And you can actually, and what Daniel did is actually he, managed, he could solve analytically uh, the entire problem in response to an optogenetic um, activation. And from this, you can see that actually the, the, the response uh, is the, the response. So the cell is quite complex. The cell starts re, uh, responding and constricting mainly at the edge, which is what you expect in the presence of friction. But then the strain field diffuses inwards. Which is exactly here. So this is a displacement of the cells as a function of initial position and as a function of time. And you can see that they start sort of shrinking, but shrinking most from the edge. 
And actually, from this from this set of equation, you can you can fit them quite well to a linear model, and you can extract every um, you, can, you can extract essentially in one go uh, every time scale of every time scale of the problem, the time scale for ERC activation, the, the, the delay from ERC to, to the shape changes, uh, and the, me the the mechanical diffusion and, and friction, and we get parameters actually which are uh, consistent with what has been estimated in different ways um, with, with the rest of the literature. So so now the, the advantage with this is that uh, we can actually test it uh, because because our wavelength and and the time scale. Um, we're, we're just dependent on this. So if you plug this number, th these numbers actually, you predict a, a wavelength which should be around 10 or 20 cents and a time scale of the oscillation uh, which should be between one and two hours. Uh, and if you, and again, actually this is, ex uh, what was cool is that this was very, very close to, to the experimentally uh, measured data in the absence of free parameters. Um, and so, so these are experimental and theoretical chemographs uh, um, in, in the absence of any free parameters. And you can see that actually you, you can reproduce quite well um, the, 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 the complex, uh, the, 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 propag the, the spatial temporal propagation of complex isotropic waves, and, and that you, and that even the, the, um, the, 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 the values of the, of the wavelength and period are quite reasonable uh, based on the data. So, so this is the first part, let's say, on the biophysical origin of these waves. But one thing you might ask is, what are these waves good for, right? What are they doing? Uh, what are they doing? If you think back about Turing patterns, that there's a clear uh, there's a clear design principle that you want to make patterns, you want to make stripes on your zebra, for instance, let's say. Um, but here, what what are these? I mean, wh why would you want to to give rise to this constant sort of oscillatory pattern uh, in 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 waves? Well, in, in these conference systems, this might look um, uh, a bit useless where there's azotropic, but as I said before, if you look at a chemograph now of, of the monolayer in response to a wound, what I've, what I've showed you before, this is just a chemograph of the movie that I showed you before, the waves now become uh, unidirectional and start propagating exclusively from the edge of the wound, right? Um, and that's accompanied with, a lot, lot, with, with something that's also well known in the field is that the monolayer uh, polarizes on long, on, 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 uh, on, on, long, um, on long distances. So basically, if you now look at the polarity of the cell, which is essentially, um, if, you, if you take a vector from the green to the, the red, it tells you the direction in which cells are actively migrating. Uh, you can see that it's not only the edge cells which, which are going towards the wound, it's also cells which are quite far millimeters away from the wound. How do you know those? Uh, know where to go, right? How do they know uh, to point to, towards the left, right? Well, if you if you combine these two, it's quite seductive, right, to think that uh, that, that these two things uh, are related and that this might be a mechanism for um, for for information transduction. And actually, this was something that was uh, uh, shown in the past nicely by by by, by Aoki, which was actually uh, if you uh, if you make an optogenetic uh, if you make a synthetic ERC wave, cells can migrate against it, so, so which, which again validates really the idea that, that cells can uh, read information from these ERC waves and uh, mi migrate in the opposite direction. Okay, so again, let's let, let's do the same and let's just um, add polarity to these equations. And again, we want to, uh, the, the strategy is really to try to write it as, as generic as possible. So what Daniel did is really to consider every uh, coupling allowed by symmetry up to linear order. And essentially, um, if you want in the paper, he, he looked at quite a few of the, the different sort of uh, couplings, but, but actually um, the, the main one that could uh, explain the data is to write um, a London Ginsburg type equation for, for the polarity field, which relaxes with some the given time scale and which crucially is coupled uh, to, to your gradients of stresses. And I should say in 1D, there's not that many things, there's not that many couplings that are allowed by symmetry. Um, so, so you want a vector field, right? So, so the, the, the main way to couple it to stress is through, is through gradients of stresses. And that's something that's, that's also reasonable because that's, that's something that's born by the, by, by, uh, by the literature. So the thing now is you can, what, you, what you can ask is you can impose now a wave, an earth wave on a tissue, and you can ask, can cells migrate against it with, uh, with, the, with the previous model plus the simple equation on polarity where cells migrate um, up gradients of stresses? And actually, one of the, the, the key things that, that, um, that maybe a posteriori is, is, quite, is, is quite intuitive is that this doesn't work. If you, if you impose an earth wave to this model, uh, the waves cannot go anywhere. Uh, and actually, th this is something that's, that, that's uh, known in dextrostinium uh, quite well. It's called the back of the wave paradox. And the reason for this is that you, you, you can't, you, you can't it, it's really hard to get to directionality uh, from a symmetric wave, right? The, because your wave is symmetric. And so if you're reading, if, let's, say, let's take a mechanical wave, let's say in blue, um, if, if your wave is sinusoidal or, or, or symmetric, 
uh, half of the time you're going to go um, half if you read this gradient half of the time you're going to go left and half of the time you're going to go right and that's and you, you're going to end up be, being completely completely stationary right uh, but the cool thing in this is that uh, we have a we have both mechanical and chemical waves and these are coupled with the delays right so actually this picture that i had here is not correct uh, the picture, the generic picture you should have is that these uh, these uh, chemical and mechanical waves should uh, are completely generically uh, out of phase. And now, if you start having two waves out of out of phase, you can really generically um, uh, extract information out of this, right? And the simplest way you, you can do that is to have a nonlinearity where you read your directionality based on stress gradient, based on gradients of the gradients of mechanics, but your magnitude. Uh, the magnitude of this coupling is modulated by the earth wave and suddenly it works instantly because uh, let's say let's say in this situation here um you want to go to uh, you, you read off this uh, this positive gradient of, of mechanics here in blue and you go towards the the right but this is amplified uh, because here earth is low whereas here you want to go towards the left but this is killed by a, by a high earth right essentially this is like doing interference with two ways and you can completely generically um, break symmetry and then suddenly uh, kill off the part of the negative parts of the polarity you don't like and only keep the positive parts of the polarity. So this is a really simple, let's say, design principles that you can get out of these um, mechanochemical uh, waves. Um, there's actually, uh, so, so, so Tsuyoshi Chiu, and, and Aoya did, not, I mean, they have a number of experimental evidence actually uh, for this nonlinearity um, and, 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 this, and this components. I'm not going to go too much into details. Um, uh, to, to, to go uh, to explore a bit more the, the, the theory of this, because the cool thing you can do is you, if you add this nonlinearity, you can then ask, let's impose a wavelength of any period or, or wave, uh, let's impose a wave of any period or wavelength. Is there an optimal one to give rise to large scale polarization? And this is the average polarity uh, you get in the monolayer as a function of the period and the wavelength of the wave that you impose. And actually, you can. Um, this is a numerical simulation with some noise, but you can actually uh, get. Uh, uh, Daniel could actually get an analytical expression for this. And the cool thing is that there's actually a single optimum. So there's a unique uh, optimal value um, uh, of wavelength and period, which gives rise to to robot, to, to optimal and, and large scale uh, polarity where the cells migrate super fast in one direction. And if we plug in the numbers from before, the, the cool thing is that this optimum. Uh, occurs for for links for for wavelengths let's say between ten and thirty cells and for period between one and six hours. Um, and if you plug a numbers of numbers from from a num from uh, from the, from um, different groups in the field, uh, again as I told you, this one to six hours and ten to thirty cells is actually very close to the typical numbers uh, that you get in the literature, which which it's not exactly optimal, of course, um, but 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 rather interestingly, it's, it's it's quite close to 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 the optimality criteria which we could predict uh, in a, in a parameter-free manner. The other thing you can do is uh, now here I was imposing any period and wavelength, but uh, and I was sort of forgetting the the biophysical origin of the waves. But 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 I have a mechanism that I showed you before for making these waves, right? And so in fact, this is not completely uncontrolled. And in fact, this black thing here is the dispersion relation that comes from a biophysical model. What are the, the what what's the relationship between the period and the wavelength allowed by 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 my biophysical model from the first part of the talk? And uh, again, this, this is not intrinsically optimal. Uh, this could give rise to, to, to very low polarities or to very large polarity. So optimality has to be fine-tuned. But the cool thing is that um, you can't, uh, what, what you can prove analytically as well, is that this, can, your, your, um, this mecha biophysical mechanism can only give rise to, to positive values of my polarity. So here you had uh, here this is these are regions of the phase diagram where the the monolayer would polarize in the reverse direction would go to, against a free edge, uh, but that's inaccessible uh, through the model. So the model is not intri intrinsically optimal. You have to um, you have to, to fine tune, but it's completely generically robust in the sense that any value uh, any value of parameter is going to give rise to at least some level of positive polarization uh, to close the wound, um, which which on the design principle side might be. Um, of course, could be uh, is quite nice for this kind of systems. So now uh, it, it, the last the last test of the model is we wanted to uh, really put everything together uh, because here here this was imposing uh, the, the first part of the talk was the biophysical of the range of the wave and here was more the design principle right imposing a wave and seeing the response of the system. But of course now you can just uh, simulate the entire system of equation and see whether it gives rise to the right uh, properties. And if you look in the data, uh, initially when you release the cells from the wound, so this is time again and this is space, 
uh, initially your waves are going in every direction, but as the wound proceeds, suddenly you have this really nice, you have this cool sort of um, um, a front where you go from isotropic waves to waves being completely directional and self-organizing, and uh, self-organizing, and they self-organize really from an intro, from, from a feedback between the polarity uh, now and, uh, and and the direction of the wave. And you can see it here in the model. That's exactly what you get. Uh, you, you get this sort of front uh, which separates sort of isotropic waves and directional waves, uh, where suddenly the waves initially uh, the waves start sort of spanning uh, the entire the, the entire system, and this is accompanied by a buildup of polarity. Uh, so initially the polarity is low, um, but then but then the the, the the cell starts being polarized by these waves, and this polarity feedbacks on 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 Earth to ensure that uh, the, the waves are directional. And so at the end of the system, if you uh, at the end of at the end what you end up with here at the end of the time time course is a is, is a monorail that's entirely polarized with positive polarity that that that, that migrates towards the edge, right? And again, if you look. In, in the data, um, in the data, that's actually exactly for the polarity of the cells as a function of space. That's exactly what you see early on. Your polarity is zero, which corresponds to this line here. If you look at intermediary time point, uh, Tsurushi and Aria found that the, the, the monolayer was polarized close to the edge, but not polarized in the bulk, which is exactly what you get here, right? Polarized towards the edge and not polarized towards the bulk. And if you look later on at 21 hours, everything is polarized equally, which is exactly what you find here. Um, at, at the end, of, at, at the end, at, at the end of the movie. Um, so, so, so this was nice. They seem to reproduce quite well the, the data, both of both of ERC and of polarity. But the last thing we wanted to really understand is one of the key predictions of the model is that um, the, uh, the the origin of the wave is not due to the wall, right? Is not due to this to this uh, to this uh, to, to this uh, symmetry breaking. Um, but it's just that the, the wound sort of uses the existing isotropic waves to surf on it and orient them. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to remove this coupling uh, between stress and, and polarity uh, and, and polarity gamma. And in fact, if you look in the biological literature, there is a molecule that is exactly this, which is Merlin, which exactly sits, uh, which exactly has been shown to be mechanosensitive and to modulate uh, and, and to modulate um, and to modulate polarity. So what what uh, Tsurushi could do. He could um, he could sort of do a knockout where he removed uh, this coupling. So there should be now uh, a situation where this gamma coupling is zero. And the prediction of the model is that the wave should still happen, but be non-directional. And in fact, that's exactly if you, if I run the movie, that's now exactly what happens. So if you look at the wild type, the waves organize uh, in, in uh, towards the right. Whereas in the Merlin, there's still waves, and we measured them. They're at the same wavelength and and, and period. However, now if I run again here. These waves, you can see, they don't break directionality. They don't. They don't become unidirectional. They just keep propagating in every direction. And if you look at wound healing, it's heavily impaired uh, compared to the wild type, which is exactly what we predict. So again, if you if you if you go towards the chemograph, you can see that these waves now go in every direction, and that's exactly what you predict in a model um, where you uh, where you where you where you put your, your your gamma parameter to very small. So in conclusion to this first in, in my, the, the conclusion to this first part. Is um, essentially that that we try to, to to go, let's say, from the, from the biophysical origin to these mechanical waves um, to their design principles. And what we could show, what, what we could show is that um, the, the, the 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 spontaneous waves of density and arc in mono layers arise really as an isotropic instability uh, involving a feedback between arc and cell mechanics, which is this first sort of uh, cycle loop uh, loop here. But then, uh, as soon as you add, let's say, a, a free edge. This is co-opted by a second loop, which coupled, which is not uh, to, to this is all a scalar instability for now. But now this is co-opted by a feedback with uh, with uh, between stress and and polarity, which serves on these waves to sort of to 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 essentially direction direct them in one direction and allow for large scale symmetry breaking and robust polarization of the monolayers towards uh, to, towards one one edge. Um, so and 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 uh, the paper is uh, if you want to, to to read more actually the paper is, uh, is uh, the, the paper was published a few months ago. Um, all right, so this is actually the first part of the talk, and now what time? I am? Uh, yeah, I have a bit of I have sort of ten minutes, 10, 15 minutes to go towards the the second part, and the second part is um, similar in concept in a sense that we, we we want to understand the coupling between sort of mechanics. And um, uh, we went to some mechanical couplings and how they give rise to, to, to patterns and shape, but now in, in the context of, um, of uh, morphogenesis. 
And everything I'm going to show is, uh, is um, it was a really fun collaboration with the lab of Priscilla Liberali, and in particular, um, who is an expert on, um, on, on self-organization and, uh, and organoid morphogenesis. And in particular, uh, this is the work of two outstanding postdocs, um, Chu Tan Yang, uh, who did all of the experiments I'm going to show in her lab, and, and Shirley Shui, um, who did all of the theory in mine. So what's the system we're interested in? Um, so organ it, the system we're interested in is intestinal organoids, and the reason they're pretty cool um, for, from a theory of living system, uh, living systems of conference, I think, is that um, these you plate single uh, you plate single cells. These cells make cysts, which essentially are completely isotropic. So they're made of of uh, cells or, or, which are all of the same type, same types. And this starts breaking symmetry spontaneously. So from cells being all of the same type, um, you you some stem cell starts differentiating spontaneously. So you start making a stem cell region. Uh, which is very similar to what happens in vivo, by the way, um, uh, which has all the same markers. And after the symmetry breaking in fate, um, you, you end up with a symmetry breaking in shape where the, the, you lose sort of the, the, the spherical symmetry of, of, the, of the shape. And you end up making this sort of, um, this, this complex shape where you, your stem cell region uh, called the crypt is, is organized like this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bud uh, and the differentiated cells, the, the so-called the villus, um, are here, so that at the end, essentially, um, the, the, the shape transformation and the sort of fate transformation uh, really closely overlap where, where the stem cell region is, is sort of in the region of highest curvature here. And this is just movies here where you see the stem cells in green, right, uh, which, which arise while everything is symmetric. And then you have a shape transformation where your stem cells sort of give right, um, sit at this region of highest curvature here. And the question we, wanted, we, we really wanted to understand here is uh, how does fate um, so you have symmetry breaking, let's say, in fate before symmetry breaking in morphogenesis, and how does fate coordinate uh, this, this shape acquisition? So, so the first thing that uh, that, that Chuten did is to to uh, uh, is to image, right? Because the cool thing with these organoids, of course, is that you can make live imaging and see how um, how the, the shape transformation happens. And what what you could see is that when she, when you make a live movie of these, you can see what's quite clear here. Is that the, these uh, organoids here undergo apical constriction, right? So, um, so, so this is in, uh, so, so the lumen is inside, right? So this is apical, this is uh, the apical side, and this is the basal side. And you can see here uh, that these cells uh, are quite constricted on the apical side, right? They, they adopt this weight shape, uh, and she could actually show that this is myelin independent, which is something that's um, that, that, um, that actually has been uh, looked at in vivo as uh, in, in vivo as well. Um, so, so this is, let's say, a classical mechanism of apical constriction that tends to bend uh, the tissue. Uh, however, interestingly, what you can uh, dis uh, discover as well, something a bit more unexpected, was that um, if you look, if you if you now contribute more on the volume of the organoid, if you contribute on the volume of the lumen uh, here, um, and when she uh, when she measured this, she showed that actually, uh, as the organoid sort of as the crypt starts budding here. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the, the, the lumen, the, the volume of the central uh, accumulation of the, the volume of the lumen decreased quite a bit. And this is actually here in, in, in orange. You can see that the volume of the lumen uh, decreased by, by 60%, essentially. And this, which you can see here, I think, right, as the, as the crypts bud, uh, the, 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 the volume of the lumen here decreases quite a lot. And here, this is this, this was interesting because this is a slightly different picture where where, you, where this this evokes more deflating a football, right? This, this, this invokes a, 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 a buckling instability where you deflate a football and you increase the surface to volume ratio, and that would also, of course, tend to to fold um, to, to fold the, to, to fold the tissue. Uh, and, and she could show that actually one of the reasons why this wasn't conspicuous at first is that the volume it's not that the volume of the entire organ changes, but rather it's it's a relocation. Of, of volume from the from the lumen to the cells, and so that's why if you if you measure the entire volume of the lumen, you might not see that. But uh, sorry, if you measure the entire volume of the organoid, you might not see that. Uh, but you but if you measure the lumen specifically, it really uncovers a striking sort of uh, um, a, a, a striking change, which could be expected, let's say, to have also influence on on um, on, on, morpho on on morphogenesis. And so what we what we set up to do uh, in this collaboration, there, therefore, is to try to make a quantitative model of these organoids to really understand biophysically the, the relative contribution of these different uh, of, of these different components to, to morphogenesis. 
And in particular, what, what, what inspired us really is that if you combine the, this idea of bending spontaneous, uh, uh, this idea of, of, of bending apical construction plus volume changes, it, it re it's really reminiscent of the literature in, in lipid vesicles and, and the budding transitions in lipid vesicles. For those that are not familiar, this is something that's been looked um, uh, in, in the 90s quite a bit, for instance, if you, if you have a lipid vesicle with a domain in red, which wants to have a spontaneous curvature, this is gonna be a bit curved here um, in, um, in, uh, in red. As soon as you deflate the, uh, the, this, this vesicle a tiny bit, essentially the, what, what energetically optimal is suddenly to start budding out this script because you, because you, you sort, of, sort of release uh, tension from the nonlinear, and the simplest way to do is to close the crypt here. So you have the so-called budding transition as soon as you decrease uh, your volume because of spontaneous curvature. And in fact, uh, what we did is it, what, what we what we did is to write the equivalent now, but um, but uh, um, writing the detailed mechanics of these organoids, in particular again um, write, uh, writing it as a um, as a vertex model, um, which is again considering. Um, that uh, the, the, these organisms are like formed with um, with, uh, with differential apical, lateral, and and, uh, and basal tension. But similarly, uh, we wrote essentially um, the, the mechanics of these organoids as two regions, uh, stem cells and, uh, and and differentiated cells, which can in principle have, of course, completely different mechanical properties. And we wanted to, what we really wanted to understand is how different uh, fates, how are the different fates, how the, how the fact that the cells are biochemically different in the left towards the right, impact the mechanics of those, and what are the minimal assumptions you need to make on this coupling to explain, um, to explain quantitatively the data. Um, so that's exactly what we, what we set up to do. And essentially, uh, I'm not gonna write all of the equations of this because uh, they're quite complicated, but, 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 but the cool thing that Shirley could, uh, that, that Shirley could find is actually you can reduce uh, the system to actually quite few uh, parameters, uh, three or four, uh, depending on. Uh, depending on, on how generally you, you, you want to write it. And what, what really could show is that actually there's only three classes of mechanisms really that can give rise to, to, to budded shape. Uh, the first one essentially is one which is associated to really the bending, the out of print bending of the tissue. And this is linked to, let's say, uh, your crypt, let's say, let's say left, that puts all of actinomycin on the apical side and the cells want to have um, a curved shapes, a spontaneous curvature, uh, and, that tends to, and that tends to sort of bud the crypt here on the left. The other mechanism you have is a completely different mechanism, which is more related to buckling. Uh, well, let's say your, your, your crypts have, your, your stem cells have a lower in plane tension, so they want to spread out. Um, and they're gonna spread out, let's say, by, 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 uh, by, by in plane extension. Or the third mechanism is a boundary term, basically, uh, where the stem cells and the crypt don't like each other, so there's some penalty at the boundary, and this is like a ring that could close down uh, the organoid. So in principle, this is this is fine. This can give rise to body shape. But the cool thing is that uh, if you now look at say, at at, um, at morphometric parameters, and in particular the height of these cells, for instance, this is going to give rise to completely opposite coupling. Because here, uh, this is going to give rise to to cell thickening, uh, whereas here this is going to give rise to cell thinning, for instance. And here the the, the different um, height of the monolayers uh, are, are going to be completely different. So what Shirley could do is essentially write completely generically, theoretically, the type of sort of the the, the global mechanisms and show that even though they can superficially fit, they're going to give rise to very different uh, detailed morphometrics of, um, of, of your organoids. And to cut a long story short, when we actually looked uh, at the data, um, maybe not surprisingly given why I showed it before, the, the, the mechanism that worked was really this one of spontaneous curvature uh, were, were in, in apical constriction, basically. Uh, and the reason for this is that this predicts that the, that, um, that the crypts should, 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 should thicken as they, as they bulge out. And it's exactly the data. When we measured the thickness here of this crypt in red, as it was bulging out, it was, inc uh, it was increasing uh, as a function of, it was increasing as a function of time. And if you turn quantitatively, if you, let's say, assume uh, that this apical tension, that this, this tension in the crypt, this, this, this apical constriction is increases linearly in time, you can in fact fit uh, morphometric parameters such as the thickness ratio or the radius of curvature ratios uh, of the different crypts. But this is really not a very good model, right? Because um, you have to assume some temporal evolution of your of your of your of your of your forces. You have to assume you have to fit every every single organism. It, it's really not that there's quite a lot of parameters. It's really a very weak. Uh, theoretical test, so we were not so, so happy with this. Um, but but what Shirley realized is that even though fitting each parameter as a function of time gives rise to many adjustable parameters, 
what you could do instead is plot one observable as a function of the other. And what, it, what turns out is actually, if you plot out one observable as a function of the other, for instance, the, thick, the, the radius of curvature ratio between these two, two regions versus the thickness ratio between these two regions, actually, surely suddenly could get super simple uh, scaling laws between these two observables where time and sort of for the, the evolution of the different parameters was completely, were, were, were completely canceled and up to a single parameter essentially, um, I mean, you, you essentially could pre predict the scaling law um, between the two and up to a, with, with only a single uh, free parameter, which was, uh, which is this prefactor PM here. And now the cool thing is that if you do this in, in the data, if you rescale, if, if you plot one parameter as a function of the other, even though each parameter as a function of time looked very different, all of them up to a single parameter sort of collapse uh, quite well onto each other and obey quite well also the, the scaling law that was predicted, where here the only prediction is this, this class of mechanisms where, where, the, where, where things happen uh, due, to, due, due to, to spontaneous curvature. All right. Um, and now, to, uh, now um, to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cut a bit uh, to, for, for the sake of time, but this is, this is let's say, the, the, the mechanics of the, of the organoid, like the, the tensions at the level of the monolayers. But the second player, which I discussed before, uh, is really the, 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 the lumen deflates, right? That, the, uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that during the time evolution, there's also this deflation of the lumen, which could give rise to a buckling, more of a buckling type instability. So what we did for this is to, what we did rather, is to um, do a, a quantitative phase diagram where on one side he had, let's say, the spontaneous curvature, the, 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 forces, the, the forces in the crypt, and on, the, on this side was uh, the deflation, the deflation of the lumen. And what you could find is if you start from something symmetric, where the, the, uh, something symmetric, uh, you, you, have two, you, have, you, you have a bit two ways of, of giving rise to, to bodied crypts. Either for completely constant volume, um, you, you, can, um, you, you can increase your, 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 your spontaneous curvature and that buds out your, and that, that causes your crypts to bud out here. Uh, but the other thing that helps a lot, of course, if, if you start, let's say, from something which is already slightly budded and you just decrease the volume of the lumen, uh, this is, of course, going to help and this is going to close um, the, the lumen. So both of them really contribute, uh, both of the, them really contribute to, um, to, um, to, to, the, to, to budding instability, again, like in the pit vesicles. What was cool, however, is that if you uh, encounter one thing that novel that showed up and wasn't there in the diagram of, phase, of, of lipid vesicles is here, for instance, let's say um, I have a budded crypt and I, and I increase my volume again, I'm going to unfold, I, I'm going to unfold my crypt. My, my crypt in red is going to reopen compared to volume. And that's what you expect for lipid vesicles. However, if you pass a threshold of, of, of spontaneous curvature of atomizing forces, you can increase your volume to infinity. Um, it's a proper, uh, you can increase your volume to infinity and this is never going to happen. Your crypt is always going to stay closed, which is quite weird um, in, uh, in, in, in lipid vesicles. And, and we, we uh, should have quite a bit of theory of this. It's a proper phase transition. You can characterize it. Uh, I'm not going to go too, too much in detail. Uh, but this is really due to the fact that, you're, that, that when, you, when, when, you're, when your crypts uh, add apical tensions on the apical side, they, they not only create spontaneous curvature, but they also increase their rigidity, which means that it's always energetically favorable to inflate uh, the velus, basically. And then, uh, but, but then um, to tell, we, we could actually test this quite quantitatively because Chutan was, was doing uh, some really cool experiments where she could actually go through the phase diagram by taking these early organoids, which here are slightly budded, only slightly budded, right? So they're expected theoretically to be here. And she could plug a pipette into these and manipulate the volume, right? So, so you're here and you really in the volume to, to check essentially whether you come back to, to, towards the right and you reopen your crypt. And that's exactly what happened when she was inflating the, 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 the crypt. You could see that you, you go back to something quite spherical and you stretch your crypt quite a lot. So you can use this really as a rheological assay to test for, for, for the mechanical properties and go through the phase diagram. And here it's exactly what you get, right? You go back to something spherical. However, the big prediction is if we take a later crypt where the tensions are larger and the tensions are here, this shouldn't move again. The crypt should stay completely steady. And in fact, when she, when she was doing this, is exactly what happens. When you take a late organoid and you inflate here, the crypt here stays completely stationary and it's the differentiated cells here that take all of the deformation, which is exactly what you expect above this critical value, um, whether this crit critical value of the tension is critical sort of developmental time point. 
And um, without going into the, the details, we, we looked quite a bit at, the, um, at, 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 at this transition point. But we think that, and again, from the point of view of design principle, what, what's quite nice is you pass a threshold where essentially your stem cells are completely mechanically protected against mechanical deformation because your, 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 your mechanical deformation are entirely borne out by uh, the, the differentiated cells, which are softer. And if you think about the real intestine, right, which constantly has peristaltic stresses, this could be quite um, a nice mechanism to protect essentially the, 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 the stem cells against, uh, against, um, against mechanics. Um, again, this is this is qualitative. This is a qualitative validation of the phase diagram. Um, Shelley again uh, went much, uh, quite quite a bit further and again derived scaling laws uh, between the different observables, um, which again are, are are really parameter lean. And without uh, cutting a long story short, basically, for instance, uh, he could he could check this these scaling laws very well. So if you go, for instance, in the region uh, where the crib doesn't unfold. Uh, you can derive again a scaling law between the radius of curvatures and the thickness, and 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 this and, and all of the experiments we scale quite well on, on the predicted uh, on the predicted scaling. And similarly, if you go towards the um, towards the early organoids which unfold due to pressure, you can derive a different scaling law. And again, uh, this is a slightly bit more noisy, but but uh, but, it, but it seems to obey quite well um, this, uh, this this simple uh, this simple mechanical uh, this simple mechanical properties. So, so this is the end of the talk. Um, I uh, essentially the conclusion here of the second part is um, that fate essentially in this intestinal organoid fate instructs uh, differential um, mechan mechanical and osmotic forces, uh, spontaneous curvature through through atomizing forces in the crypt, and um, osmotic stresses which deflate the, the lumen from the virus. And together, uh, this gives rise to to morphological symmetry breaking, um, which is extremely robust. Uh, to mechanical perturbation uh, above, a, uh, above a critical point. And I would like to, to close the land here. I would like again to acknowledge um, the two, the, the PhD student Daniel and, and the postdoc Shelley that did all of the work, as well um, as our collaborators, which, uh, which uh, it was really fun to, to work with, in, in particular, the lab of Presca Liberali um, in FMI Basel and the lab of Tsuyoshi Hashima uh, in Kyoto. And thank you again for the invitation, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>